G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Experts. Now today, back by popular demand, we have a returning guest in Mr. John Sander from Lubrication Engineers. So John has obviously uh, been on the podcast before, gave some fantastic explanations. And so today, what we're going to be talking about is uh, the age-old question of sort of minerals versus synthetics, uh, and maybe dispel some myths about what synthetics are um, and what they are not. So uh, John, thank you so much for being a returning guest. Well, you're welcome, Rafe, and it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm looking forward to doing this. Yeah, this will be this one will be really good because uh, I think you know there's some general interest uh, I think in the, in this particular topic, and maybe to help us get started, uh, where we could really begin is kind of the history behind the distinctions between minerals and, and synthetics. So, uh, mm -hmm. for everyone anyone who's not familiar, there are kind of five different base oil groups. So, group one, two, three, four, and five. Um, you know, historically, we have referred to groups one, two, and three as being mineral oils. Group four is synthetic, and we'll get into what that means. And group five is kind of a catch-all term for everything else. So uh, maybe, John, could you just run us a little bit through the history? You know, um, why is it that uh, we have three different types of mineral oils um, and, and naphthenic mineral oils are kind of their own thing? Um, why are. is it that PAOs are kind of special? Like, why did they get their own little special category um, versus everyone else? Like, I think some of the history behind it will, will help um, help us categorize the different types of base oils. I, I think so too, Rafe. So I, 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 great question. I, going back, the American Petroleum Institute actually uh, in, instituted a plan for base oils. And what that came down to is it started off with engine oils, not surprisingly, one of the biggest lubricant markets that's out there. And when you also look at the amount of testing that's involved with getting an engine oil formulation approved, it's significant. And so I think a lot of people over the years have said, well, oil's oil. And over time, they figured out, well, oil isn't just oil. There's, there's various different types, depending on what kind of crude source they came from, what kind of refining technique they were refined by and so on. So with that in mind, there became this need to differentiate these oils. And so the when API was uh, putting together the engine oil testing programs back in 1980s, they devised this, actually at that time, only a three-level tier system that you already somewhat described. And those were all basically the oils. And the majority of that was based on the saturates levels within the oil the sulfur content, and then finally the viscosity index of the oil. But how are those devised? Those are devised, or, or you know, they're, they're a property that comes out of the lubricant, lubricant base stock based upon the refining and processing of that oil. Uh, I use the term saturates in there. Saturates basically means if you've got a, uh, this is a hydrocarbon, so these black ones are carbon and the white ones are hydrogen. And so while I call this a straight chain hydrocarbon, I know you see it's got a curve in it. And unfortunately, the way chemists, chemists talk, that that is still considered a saturated hydrocarbon. What that means, it's just got single bonds in it and there's no branching. And that's basically what saturated means. When they start talking about unsaturation, they're talking about things like these, these double bonds. You can see where you got two bonds hooking two, the carbons together and, and then the, the, the oxygens on there, or excuse me, hydrogens, I should say. This one would also be considered unsaturated because this right here would be a branch sticking off. You see this, this part in here would be your straight chain down in here, and this would be a branch. So branching is another thing that starts to make it be considered unsaturated. It's still overall saturated, but it can still be hydrogen and uh, carbon. Now. This group right here would be an oxygen. Oxygen is another thing that kind of exists fairly naturally, as well as nitrogen. I didn't put one of those on here. But you can see that's another thing that would be considered unsaturation. We, we added another atom into the molecule, for example. So uh, at that point, they still consider this a hydrocarbon. But anyway, that's an oxygen on there. And so uh, as chemists, we, we do have our tinker toys we like to play with as well. So... Kind of getting down to those levels of refining. So there was the group ones, group twos, and group threes that you refer to. The group ones were your paraffinic mineral oils. And those were 
what they called solvent refined mineral oils. And they were kind of the original refining process that occurred where they used various different solvents to improve the saturation. They removed the things that were not real soluble in these certain solvents, and you would end up with a fairly saturated hydrocarbon. Uh, typically, the paraffinic based stocks end up with a viscosity index somewhere between uh, 90 and 98 ish, and those are considered your group ones. Remember, we were talking about saturate levels. The group ones also were allowed to have a little bit of sulfur in the, in the molecules as well at that point. Well, as engine oils, the engine oil specs started moving forward, a lot of what was driving those engine oil specs was emissions testing. And as part of the emissions testing, what they figured out was that these solvent refined oils, first of all, were not, uh, they, were, they were not low volatility enough. I know that sounds kind of backwards, but basically they, they would sort of burn off and then create smoke coming out of the tailpipe. So, so therefore, we're creating an emission problem. And part of that was due to the volatility of the oil getting past the rings, getting into the, uh, into the combustion chamber, and then going out through the tailpipe. So what they started looking at was, well, how do we minimize that? And one of the things they could do to minimize it was start, start to improve the volatility properties. And one of the ways they accomplished that was by uh, putting in a place higher levels of refining. So they started using a technique called hydrocracking where they actually would now take those, those double bonds that we were talking about in this molecule, and they would hit them with extreme high temperatures and high pressure, breaking that double bond and basically then hitting it with hydrogen after the fact and turning it into a saturated molecule like this one we talked about. Anyway, the desire then was uh, after you do that, they become a little bit higher molecular weight. You knock off some of the low molecular weight volatile substances. Uh, and like anything, then you get to saying, well, this is working pretty well. And because of the engine oil market being so big, they were producing more group two, more group two base stocks than they were group, uh, the group ones. And new categories come along, and now they're even needing even higher levels of, of refining in order to hit the new emissions requirements. And so they started even doing more hydrocracking and some other processes that they used to remove some of the wax and so on, or converting some of the wax into base stocks. So at that point, you can, you can start imagining you've, you're processing the dickens out of this oil. It, but you've gotten to a point now where many of us at those times still considered all three of these to be a, a, a mineral oil product and therefore kind of a naturally occurring but mineral oil product. There were companies that started making these products that were called uh, based off of a synthetic material, and synthetic was commonly used at that time to reflect a material that was synthesized, i.e. you start off with a small small piece and start putting pieces together. I like to use a, you know, the, the children's toy Lego. So if you think about Legos, you start off with one little block and then pretty soon you hook another little block together with another little block, or if you start stacking them together, well, now you just put some branches on that. So you start building whatever you're wanting to build with those Legos. So let's imagine then you, your, your, your child had gotten done playing with those Legos and they're all glued together. You know, they're all stuck together and you got this big block. Well, think about that as like crude oil. So if that was crude oil and you start breaking the, you start breaking the little blocks off there and getting it to almost that little straight chain, like, the synthetic I was talking about, well, now it acts a lot like it because once again, we're talking about saturated hydrocarbons. So one of the most common saturated hydrocarbons, uh, lubricant based fluids is the PAOs or the polyalpha olefins you talked about. And so early on, whenever somebody was talking about a synthetic, they literally were meaning PAO. So PAO was given its own category because they were making engine oils out of those. There's a couple specific companies that were making what they were calling synthetic base oils. Fast forward to the, I'm going to say, I believe it was around maybe 1990, early 90s or late 80s. Uh, these group threes were being more and more used. And one of the companies that was out of them, so there was a, there was a kind of a lawsuit that was filed between uh, Castrol and Mobil. Mobil, who was a one of the world's largest manufacturers of PAOs, was making 
their synthetic products. And there, there's, there's other companies that were doing this as well, but Mobile Lab was their main flagship product, was their Mobile One line that was made out of PAO. Uh, Castrol had come out and they started using the Group 3s and they were saying, well, these things are so highly processed that they're synthetic. So the two of them, they took it to the National Advertising Bureau court. Didn't even know it was a thing, but apparently it is. And the National Advertising Bureau here in the United States took a look at this case and said, you know, Castrol is providing a pretty strong argument here that these things are so chemically modified that they are no longer uh, pure mineral oil, but are indeed synthetic. So going back to my Lego, remember the PAO would be taking the little Legos and starting from little one small one and building them into big ones. Whereas the, the real highly refined mineral oil was taking those, those Legos apart and then sort of sticking them back together in a form that is has better properties than the original product. So long story short, you ended up with the group threes now being called synthetics and people mar able and allowed to market it as a full synthetic when they're using group three or group four. There's still, a, I think, a little bit of a rift out there of technical people, perhaps sort of like myself, who might want to try to argue, well, I've seen the term being used out there, 100% synthetic versus full synthetic. To me, they're the same thing. But what they're trying to differentiate is in their minds is back to that PAO. They're saying if it's 100% synthetic, then it's a PAO. If it's a full synthetic, then it's they're three based or they're or possibly even a combination. Mm -hmm. The only last, the last piece I'll kind of throw out there and then try to get back over to away from history and maybe more towards where we want to go, ultimately describing the synthetics in general, is that there's companies that are marketing. Partial synthetics, they call them. And I kind of want to point that out because there, that's a unique uh, animal in that there's really no regulatory requirements on making a claim about partial synthetic. You could be putting 1% synthetic in there, or you could be putting 50% or 90% and still call it a synthetic blend. So uh, be careful with that. Because if you're looking at synthetic blend, I'm not saying that some companies aren't legitimate out there. I'm saying just could vary. So if you think you're getting mostly a synthetic, it might not be. Uh, yeah. I like skin. some of the marketing uh, jargon ar around that, right? So you, I think I've seen yes. synthetic, uh, you know, uh, synthetic blend, semi-synthetic, uh, I think uh, synthetic fortified, uh, you know, partial synthetic technology mixed with synthetic technology. So, <laughs> you know, the, the marketers can get pretty creative about how to make it synthetic adjacent. They sure can. Well, the, and the interesting thing we'll find out about these is while some of these synthetics are used as base fluids, they can also be used as additives. Hmm. And so I, I don't, my, I myself would, as, a, as a formulator, would not be comfortable saying, well, I put this in there as a, say, a seal swell agent or, or whatever I put it in there for. And then calling it a partial synthetic. That just doesn't seem right to me. But I could. Periodically yeah. I could. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I didn't I didn't mention the group the, the the last group, which was the group fives. And the as you said, the group fives is basically the catch all. I mean, that's where all the other synthetics are tucked in, esters, pibs, uh polyopin glycols, even the naptanic base oils you talked about, they fall into that group because basically API is going, well, what else? might be an engine oil and it could basically have been about anything and so they wanted to create this category where we could put anything in there so the interesting thing is, is that you find that a lot of the companies that are formulating engine oils are also formulating industrial fluids like our company for example and that terminology that us technical folks had to use for the engine oils you know those group those api based fluid groups we decided to start using for descriptions of industrial products just as well as the um, automotive products. And so now it's really spilled over. And so it is kind of getting universally used for the entire lubricant market and not just the engine oil. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way of, of showing the development of the API categories. Um, uh, you know, the fact that it is so engine oil focused um, explains a lot. Right, um, and and it also explains a lot of the confusion when we come over to the industrial oils, because we obviously have a, a pretty broad range of applications. Um, so you know there are, uh, for example, a lot of 
uh, naphthenic oils related to transformers or um you know uh, even in the uh in the refrigeration world right where you end yeah. up with yeah. either naphthenics or alkyl benzenes or diesters and all this kind of stuff and it all kind of just gets lumped in as well this is all group five um, <laughs> You know, I, I always caution my, my my customers. Anyone, anytime someone says Group Five, that could mean anywhere from, you know, full max performance right through to absolute garbage, because um, it, it really <laughs> does kind of span the gamut, right? Because you know, all, all the vegetable oils are in there, or silicons are in there, and all that kind of stuff. Yes, but, but maybe just to narrow down a little bit on um on, on Group Five. So, what would be the most commonly used out of all the Group Fives? Yeah, so the most commonly used on group fives is so probably either the esters or the PAGs. And so the interesting thing is even when we go there, and I and like I said, I I don't want to deep dive these, but uh, there's not a there there are chemical differences between the two, and you can actually see how that starts to spill over into how a person might formulate, and or even how they might be compatible with the equipment you're putting them in. So it's it's very important to know what synthetic you're choosing. And for me, that's where it's always become sort of difficult is when somebody uses the term synthetic, they use it almost like it's one thing. And it really is not one thing. To your mm-hmm. point, that little group five uh, ball that we described there contains a lot of different marbles in that ball, if you will. Uh, and each one of those could be used as a standalone lubricant for specific applications. Or sometimes you're kind of put in there as additives, as I mentioned earlier. So, but definitely, I, in my opinion, it would be the esters or the polyacryl glycol. Hmm. So, what maybe might be helpful, actually, as we start to get into a bit of the discussion of group fives, is actually to take a step back and look at uh, group four, which is the PAOs, and yeah. and say, okay, what what is so good about PAOs, um, and then maybe also where are they deficient because uh, in my experience at least every base oil kind of has an achilles heel of some of some description which means that we can't use it everywhere um, and so i think helping to understand where paos are strong and where they're weak will then help explain where and when we select specific types of group fives sure no that's perfect uh, so one of the main places that they're strong on is both of the temperature extremes. So in other words, they because they have a very high viscosity index, that means that the viscosity of that fluid over temperature changes, I'm going to say relatively little, say compared to the mineral oil products we talked about already. That means that you can stretch out the temperature profile for which it can work. So it's it's going to be very fluid at very low temperatures, and it's still going to have good film strength at high temperatures. So that's a strength of it. It's a very saturated molecule by the time you get done. So if you're going to say perhaps the Achilles of it is solubility. So a lot of the additives are, are kind of what we would describe as polar, meaning they they either have, I mean, I didn't talk about oxygen in this in this molecule, for example. Oxygen has some attraction towards metals and so on, but it also uh, is not carbon or hydrogen. So like dissolves like. Hydrocarbons are very soluble in PAO, but if you start getting additives that are not completely hydrocarbon, they start having some slight challenges with solubility in there. So it turns out that you can supplement them in order to help them slightly overcome that, but that would absolutely be it. Oh, the last, the other advantage is going back to that temperature thing, because they are saturated, they don't react real easily. What that means is so as the oil, as a normal mineral oil would break down, any of those branches we were talking about and those double bonds that I was talking about earlier, those things tend to want to be reactive with oxygen that's in the air we breathe and so on. So those molecules, the uh, really hydro, highly saturated PAO molecules are pretty resistant to oxidation relative to, say, the uh, regular mineral oils that have branching and double bonds in them. Mm. The the other one that the PAOs tend to get a a, a bad rap on is uh, around seal um, stability, kind of right. I think you know there was a lot of discussion when synthetic oils first came to the market 
you know, way back in the 60s and 70s that they'd cause all kinds of leaks in, in, in cars and all that sort of stuff. Um, can you please help explain wh wh where that discussion comes from? No, that's a great point. Uh, that comes from back to that same saturation we're talking about. So you think about a lot of the polymeric seals that are used in some of the vehicles and or industrial equipment for that matter, in their natural rubbers. Uh, a natural rubber tends to be have a little bit of unsaturation in it and perhaps even uh, you know, put some sulfur compounds and things in them they call uh, uh, can, uh, vulcanization additives and so on. Anyway, what they're doing is trying to make the, the, the rubber a little bit more durable against things like rubbing and you know they like them to be stretchy and all that. What happens over time is PAO uh, has an effect where it causes it to clink a little bit. It starts pulling. I didn't say that either, but rubber oftentimes is extended with something called plasticizer, which oftentimes is oil. And so the oil wants to come out of the plastic and go into the PAO. In doing so, it makes the plastic or the rubber become smaller. And as it becomes smaller, it becomes harder. As it becomes harder, it has the ability to crack also. So if you get either shrinking or worse yet, cracking because the seal dried out, then the PAO fluid inside leaks past. So that's where you can then additize. You can put some things in there to supplement and allow and create some seal swell. So there are seal swell additives that turns out are also synthetic lubricants. Okay. Well, that might be a really good segue into talking about group five synthetics and, and yes. what they're used for. So you've already touched on one use case, which is as a seal swell additive. Um, where else would we where we talk, would we use uh, group fives? Um, I, I know this is a very very broad question, but so maybe we can just talk about the most common uses. It, it very it is a very broad subject, and so one of the ones that I didn't really give a whole lot of attention when you asked about the the large volume ones. One I probably should have mentioned was uh, polyacetylenes. Those today are being used as an alternative to bright stocks. Bright stocks is, is they've continued to use more and more of that extremely high levels of refining. It cracks the molecules in the bright stocks and, and the refineries are not producing as much bright stock. Bright stock was a very high viscosity group one base oil. And if you are not creating as much of it, well, then products like gear oils or greases were trying to achieve a high viscosity. Uh, it's just not as available. Or if it is, it's very expensive. So. Over the years, they've come up with what many people call bright stock replacements. And they've either used viscosity index improvers, which are used in engine oils often to kind of build viscosity, which is a high molecular polymer, or these polyisobutylenes I was talking about, which are kind of thick and sticky. And the name isobutylene would suggest that it's made out of those little Lego bricks I was talking about, four carbon chains. And so you, you're what you're starting with is uh, a natural gas supply type material and creating the isobutane. And then these isobutanes, they start linking them together to achieve whatever viscosity they desire. And these things can go anywhere from regular mineral oil viscosities all the way up to uh, block rubber. I mean, it can sit there by itself and, you, it, and you, you can't even really see it flowing. It will flow, but it'd be very, 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 very slow. So, or even... They can turn them into plastics. I think you may have heard of uh, in a lot of homes today that they build the water pipe a lot of times is what they call a, a polyisobutylene uh, pipe. So they can even take it up to hard plastics. And the point is basically there is what I was trying to suggest is that's a pretty high volume synthetic as well. Uh, you could, you can actually make synthetic products out of those, as you can imagine. Uh, maybe a good example would be an open gear lubricant. But some of the synthetic open gear lubricants you see out there. Uh, historically, were made out of asphaltic, which name sounds familiar, right? Asphalt was stuff you put on roads. That was came from refining oil, and you'd refine off the fuel, the lubricating base stocks, and then have this real thick, sticky, gooey glop left over. That was asphaltic, and they and part of our industry would use those also to lubricate some open gear lubricant applications, where they either just dump it on there or spray it on there. And that allows them to have this really thick viscous material on the gears. Product work fine. 
except for the fact that it's hard to see through it and see what the gear looks like. So over the years, many companies started coming out with synthetics and some of those being either polyisobutylene thickened or some are grease thickened. But the polyisobutylene, you know, is one common way to achieve high viscometrics in that. Uh, you can think of chain applications. I, I, a common louver or base stock for those that's a group five is either polyethylene glycols or esters. Both of those are pretty common uh, in some of the, the high temperature chain applications, say in bakery ovens and so on. There's ones that are, that are actually true transcendental food contact. Uh, the nice thing about some of the esters, depending on the selection of the ester base stock, is that they will cook off. And when they begin to cook off, they leave behind a, a carbonaceous residue that has somewhat lubricating properties, but it's still a problem. It's, a, it's, it's residue. So if you keep accumulating residue and accumulating residue, and maybe you get contaminants in there with it, it, it maybe can become hard and crust up on the chain. A lot of the chain users are familiar with that. They're used to knocking it off and reapplying and going forward. But there's some that can't, can't, they can't, just can't do that. It, either they can't shut down or whatever. So that's when they might go with the polyethylene glycol. When the polyethylene glycols are back to our Lego bricks. So now your, your Lego brick is basically a, a either they start with ethylene oxide and then they turn that into an alcohol of ethylene, uh, you know, and like ethylene alcohol or propylene or butylene. And then they start linking chains together of any one of those three depending on what they want to achieve. So if you're in the metalworking industry, a lot of times they're using more of the ethylene molecule, which can tend to have some water solubility. You're trying to get more towards the traditional lubricants. You're going to start trying to build them out of the propylene and butylene molecules, which are more oil, that more like oil. Uh, the nice thing about putting those in a chain application like I was talking about is you get the real high temperatures in those little bricks that I was talking about and because there's a lot of oxygen in the molecular structure of the polyethylene glycol, they cleave and then form smaller, lower molecular weight substances that basically vaporize off. So typically speaking, unless you've got a slug of additives of some sort built into that polyethylene glycol, they tend to be pretty re residue-free. So that can be an advantage. But residue-free ultimately means it cooks off and there's nothing left. So that's why, that's why there's always these challenges of what, what, what product do I pick and what works for my application? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it, it's kind of cool to see that there's a, such a, a wide variety that's, that's available to us. Um, and it's not, Is it? yeah, it's not just the minerals and the PAOs. There's, there's all, all kinds of other stuff out there. So how... I always like to think in a refrigeration uh, application is a is a good way of describing the chemical differences. So we, you know we talked a little bit about the structural differences of all these molecules and how yeah. that affects where you might use them. Refrigeration is one of those instances where you know we're looking at potential uh, interaction between the refrigerant and uh, and the molecule. Obviously, that's undesirable, but but it, it's going to happen in some cases. And that seems to drive a lot of the selection choices. And, you know, when you look at a, a, a range of uh, refrigerants, uh, like I was saying before, you know, you'll have uh, naphthenic oils, you'll have mineral oils, you'll have PAOs, you'll have PAGs, you'll have, um, you know, alkyl benzenes in some cases, esters, diesters, you know. Uh, That's it, right. Basically, it, it's kind of like a microcosm of all of the different synthetic oils that are available to us. So, could you please help me uh, understand? Like, what is it? We don't have to go through each individual type of base oil, but yeah. what are some of the decision points uh, that you as a formulator would go through to match a, a refrigerant to a base oil? Like, what, what is the chemistry that's involved there? That's a, a great question. And it is fairly complex. So it turns out there's actually a set of standards by a group that formed an industry group called ASHRAE. And they developed a set of tests that are, that are required for you to actually do compatibility testing between specific refrigerants in the type of refrigerant, refrigerant fluid that you're going to uh, be putting into that compressor. 
So I, I'm going to be dating myself a little bit here, but when I first started, all you had was the CFC refrigerants. And, well, that's not true. There was also ammonia. Ammonia and CFCs were pretty much the thing. And to your point, the naphthenic base oils were amazing for those. They, they had good compatibility. The, and, and I think one of the main things with, the, uh, with those early on CFC refrigerants is they basically were a methane molecule that either had fluorine or chlorine or a combination of both incorporated into its molecular structure, but they, were, they vaporized very, very rapidly and very easily. And as, as such, they were capable of being used fairly well with the mineral oil. Uh, when you started getting to some of the more of the newer ones, as they, start, as they started outlawing the use of some of the CFCs, they began to try to come up with these new ones that were no longer quite as vaporizable. So they, they, they would negatively affect the viscometrics of the oil and therefore the durability of the pump, for example. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I mean, there's just, there's so much in there. <laughs> um, that's really probably is. an entirely separate po uh, podcast, to be honest. Um, there, there's, there's companies out there right now that literally what they do. So I, I agree. It could be podcast. Yeah. On each other. In yeah. fact, uh, I, I brought this just for the sake of arguments with what we're talking about. So this is a book on synthetics. <laughs> so, so well, you know, we start off saying, well, this could be a very simple synthetic. Is it one thing? Well, obviously, if there's one thing, that'd be a really boring book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely. not. There's a lot of there's a lot of information in that book. So that's why, to your point, you can write full subjects. There's full chapters on some of these synthetic base loads that are in there, and there and how they're made and how they're used. And so, uh, I I never want anybody to oversimplify that. But I also then, as an end user, it, it creates a lot of questions going on. Now I'm scared to death about this. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask a little bit about that. Uh, you know, as we as we come to a close here, um, you know, what's the future for, you know, the Group Fives, for for want of a better word? Um, do you see, you know, as a lot of these applications become more specialized, do you see the use of Group Fives in some ways increasing? So before, you know, it felt like the default was okay. We need a high performance lubricant in an industrial application make it a PAO. Now we're seeing a lot more, you know, maybe discernment um, and use of specific group fives for specific applications. That's what, that's how I feel anyway. I'd, I'd like to get your take on it. And then does that present pro problems for the end user in terms of, you know, compatibility and how they're storing all these products on site and stuff? Absolutely, Rafe. They definitely can create problems in terms of compatibility, depending on what you transition to from or from to, however you want to say that. And or to your point, if you you can create a problem just on how you store the products, if you use the same transfer container and didn't rinse it out, for example, and all of a sudden you're pouring a little bit of little little pieces of slow slime or something into the machine because you didn't realize these two uh, lubricants that you just mixed together were incompatible with one another. So you do definitely need to be concerned about that and be aware of what application the product's going to go into. I do see an absolute movement towards more synthetics. I do see that continue, that trend continue. But what's interesting is there are some synthetics now that I would have never thought were going to be challenged that are seeing some challenges. For example, the, the fluoro ether type products that are out there. Uh, those are used in a lot of your uh, space type applications and things where you need to have a very high temperature, extremely oxidation resistant type base fluid. Well, how did they get to that point? Well, they got to that point because they don't degrade very easily. And so now they're calling these you know, some of the substances forever substances. So uh, one of the compounds we're very familiar with is they call PTFE or Teflon. And Teflon's basically a brand name from DuPont, but kind of used almost like a Kleenex for tissue these days. Anyway, um, some of these are starting to come under fire a little bit because uh, there's becoming more and more pressure towards products that are more environmentally friendly, i.e. biodegrade or don't bioaccumulate within the organisms walking around, our, our cells, for example. And that's one of the things I've been finding is that some of these perfluoroethylene substances 
are beginning to show up more and more in even uh, small infant creatures. And that means it's obviously passing from one generation to the other through uh, one, whether, whatever we're eating and so on. So they call that bioaccumulation, for example. So some of those are coming under pressure. I've heard some, I've read some things about some of the silicon, the, the siloxane chemistries, which are also used as silicon lubricants, silicone lubricants. Those are actually approved for medical use and, and even uh, for direct food contact use. And some of those are even beginning to get some scrutiny because they're being looked at as a little bit of forever fluids. And, and so that's becoming an issue. And as regulatory pressures get tighter and tighter on the industry, it may affect some of these synthetics. Uh, but, but on, like I said, the other side of that is I do feel like some of the users are now starting to understand the value and they're looking for other things as part of their sustainability missions they're, they're putting in place. Well, now I need to do things to reduce my carbon footprint. And so when we talked about, say, a, a naphthenic oil versus a paraffinic versus PAO or maybe even as an ester type product, if you can create better flow through a machine, uh, I think you mentioned it in our last podcast, we talked about inside the hydraulic systems, reducing the eddy flows and things that occur in there because you're picking a fluid that has less molecular friction between the molecules, for example. Uh, you now start to save energy, whether that energy is in the form of fuel or electricity, which reduces your carbon footprint. And a lot of companies have these sustainability initiatives in place to try to do that. Uh, as such, they may move towards those products and start embracing them more thoroughly. Uh, back to the esters. One of the positive advantages of an ester is many of them come from natural sources, and then they're, they are chemically modified to give them uh, enhance some of their properties, but still, they come from a natural source. So oftentimes, they're considered to be sort of carbon neutral. I mean, one could argue they're not completely because obviously you got to go through uh, sending something out to the field and pick them and turn them into uh, a, a usable lubricant stock and all that stuff. So it's not completely carbon neutral, but yet there is still a lot of favorability given to something that is in that's natural and biodegradable. And because these have oxygen in their structure, as they are contacted with a lot of the marine in soil type things that are out there in the environment, there's organisms in there that can easily eat them and turn them in back into carbon dioxide and oxygen. So you do see a little bit of favor given, being given to either vegetable oil or modified vegetable oils, which mm. are what I would call synthetic esters, for example. Yeah, really interesting. So it's, it's, it's this push and pull of kind of performance, uh, chemistry, toxicity, biodegradability, um, and, or, and compatibility we talked about. Um, and so I think what that in, in some ways emphasizes to me is uh, the importance of people who understand lubricants and lubrication and, and, and get yeah. that it's not uh, just one, you know, mineral or synthetic, uh, that there is uh, kind of diversity to to all of these different products and potentially their, their use is going to be increasing. So I think that's uh, firstly a, a very promising thing for our industry, but also, um, you know, uh, maybe a, a word of caution to end users to, to hopefully increase their, their knowledge of, um, of lubricants and, and lubrication. But uh, John, as always, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks so much for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. I'm sure that uh, a lot of people are going to get, um, some good information out of this particular podcast and hopefully we've um we've turned on some minds with this one uh so um you know thanks so much for coming back on the podcast again and uh we'll talk again soon well you're welcome and thank you for providing this platform i, I have fun doing it you're a great person to talk to <laughs>